Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Annette Russ. Um, today's webinar is hosted by the Butte County Public Library in conjunction with the local volunteer mentor organization called SCORE, of which I am a member. Um, today's webinar, we're going to be talking about personal finance, and I'd like to share with you an alternative way to think about your, your finances. Uh, in addition, today I'll be giving you some practical tips and techniques that can help you manage your finances better. Before we get started, I'm going to talk a little bit more about SCORE, um, which is a national network of uh, volunteers, expert business mentors, basically, that help, we help small businesses get off the ground. Uh, we've been in business since 1964, and we, during that time, we have educated more than 11 million entrepreneurs. We offer confidential business counseling services at little or no charge. And nationally, we have mentors from over 60 different industry that have a wide array of knowledge and experience that small business owners can uh, call, call on in order to help them launch their business or to grow their business. Uh, SCORE also provides local workshops, uh, sometimes in person or sometimes um, via Zoom like this one is, um, and events throughout the country and connecting uh, business owners and people with the information that they need to maintain a business or to manage their finances. And on the National SCORE website, which is at SCORE.org, we also have a lot of resources available. One of those is online workshops that are recorded workshops that you can watch on demand. And there's a whole list of other kinds of resources as well, like templates and tools for businesses and actually even individuals to develop the tools and plans that you might need if you're starting a business or if you're just trying to make a change in your own personal finances. Um, personally, I'm a retired CPA from Chico. I joined SCORE as a mem mentor in 2020. Um, I previously owned and operated my own accounting firm and I specialized in mentoring small business clients. I uh, did accounting for a wide variety of businesses and of course I did tax preparation. In addition to that, I taught business planning classes through the local chapter of the Small Business Development Center and I've taught accounting classes at Butte Community College. So today we're gonna to talk about an alternative way of thinking about your finance. If it's been a concern of years that you wanted to uh, find a better way to manage your personal finances, you most likely have gone in to, and Googled how to manage your personal finances in 2022. And uh, Google's returned a whole list of pages of articles written by many, many different experts on how to do that. And the, but ultimately, one of the first things experts always recommend in those articles is to make a budget. I don't know about you, but to me, budget is one of the two scariest words in the English language. And the second one is diet. Most people cringe when they hear the word budget. It really just rise, raises your stress level and immediately we think about having to make drastic cuts in our spending and primarily anticipating that those will be in the luxury items, the things that give us pleasure and that's not something we are anxious to do. Um, but if you do have a budget and you use it and at the end of the month, you go back, calculate, you know, what you've actually spent compared to the budget. And if you have are confronted with the fact that you exceeded your budget, what, what happens is we'll feel guilty or we'll feel frustrated. And most likely those feelings are going to lead to being unmotivated to continue to use that budget. And it's just going to go out the door. So here's an alternative way to think about budgeting. And I call it, rather than making a budget, get acquainted with your finances. 
there's and I'm going to tell you about a process. I want to share with you a process on how how to do that. Um, it's a project that will probably take you an hour or two to complete a one time process of what to what to complete this. So to begin with, take a piece of paper and create a list of categories for the expenses that you incur each month. Uh, don't don't use any financial documents. Don't look at your checkbook or your bank statement. Make this list of categories off the top of your head, remembering the best you can, thinking through what you spend money on each month. Then, without looking at your financial documents again, estimate as best you can how much you think you spend in each of those categories. And write that number right next to the uh, list of the categories. Okay, the third step is the hardest because now it's the time to take out your bank statements and your credit cards and to summarize one month's worth of expenses and find out what you actually spent in each of those categories during a typical month. So you're going to write that right next to the estimate of what you spent, thought you spent in each category. And then in this process, one of the things that you may come across is that everybody has an ATM card and you take frequent um, cash withdrawals from your ATM and use that cash to buy incidentals throughout the month. But unless you keep receipts or make good notes of what you have uh, used that cash to pay for, it's very hard to identify uh, where that money has gone. So right now, don't try to identify what you bought with that cash, but go ahead and add a category to the list and just label it incidentals. So here is a worksheet that I created for myself. I First of all, I started a list of my categories uh, of all the typical things that I pay for during during the month from rent. And then my I thought, you know, I did ATM cash withdrawals. Maybe a, I went to the bank once a four time once a week four times a month it took out 20 bucks so I thought maybe I had $80 that I uh, had cash that I spent throughout the month then I took out my bank statements and my credit card statements and I tallied up the actual costs of what I spent for all of these categories now the really important part of looking at the actual costs and I'm just now looking at this and seeing that I misspelled actual, so please excuse that error, that typo. Okay, back to the most important part of when you did the actual is that you can see at the bottom of my list, there were actually categories that I failed to include in my original category list. Those being streaming subscriptions, eBooks, my credit card payments, and my health club fees. So I had to add those categories to my to my list uh, to make my summary for the month complete. Next thing we're going to do is to quickly uh, calculate the difference between what you guesstimated that you uh, were going to spend and what you actually spent. So I went down and I did that on the third column here and uh, I can see that there are some significant differences. So I have made some notes now to myself about why there may be a significant difference in what I was expecting to spend and what I actually spent. So for example, right now, gas prices have really uh, skyrocketed. So rather than spending about $160 every month that I was accustomed to spending up until this point, I've now spent $250. Same with food and groceries. Prices have gone up. So for the prior 10 months, I spent on average 600 bucks for groceries, but with the increase in prices, it was $780 this month. In my mind, however, now that I'm acquainting myself with my finances, I've been subconsciously thinking, oh, I spent about 600 bucks for groceries. Now I'm actually confronted with the fact that prices have gone up and I gotta start thinking about that I have to spend more on groceries. Maybe I need to think about how I'm spending money on other items on, on my list. Uh, 
Dining out is always an interesting category because people tend to focus on just the fact that they've had dinner out. But what I think that should also be included in dining out and identified are when you have pizza uh, actually uh, delivered or you go out for pizza or you stop and pick up a coffee on your way to work, uh, go out to lunch with some working colleagues, or if you drop in at 7-Eleven and buy a soda and maybe a bag of uh, chips or nuts, that should be included also in dining out. Um, the others, the when I looked at my ATM cash incidentals there, um, I thought, it, like I said, I thought I about, did about $80 a month, but I actually found out I did $100 worth of withdrawals. But it's basically a $20 discrepancy. And so in this process, I don't want to get too heavy into the details. I really want to uh, focus on the big picture. So the $20 I'm kind of comfortable with. I don't think I need to go through and really uh, spend a lot of time in really pinpointing all of those things that I spent that money on. Um, you could do it in a general way, for example, uh, greeting cards or sport kids' sports fees or birthday presents. And so if you had some of those expenses in that particular month, you might want to note them there because that's important because now throughout the, throughout the year, you're going to have times, months that you're going to have some of those less frequent expenditures and uh, being able to think about them on this list is uh, a way that you can start to analyze your spending habits. Now, with streaming subscription and health club fees, one of the reasons I didn't include it on my initial list, in, which was incorrect, I should have included it, was because those are both automatic payments. They come right out of my uh, bank account or right off my uh, into my credit card. And as a result, those are what I would call invisible expenses. Because you're not writing a check for it uh, or paying it online banking, you don't even think about it. So it's like an invisible expense. But those invisible expenses add up. Um, I also I have one uh, vice, which is reading. And I have a Kindle, so I read a lot of ebooks. And it's just so easy, as many of you may know, that you just go into Amazon and find a new book and click buy that. And I don't always keep very good track of how many books I've bought during the month. And it's usually a big surprise as to what I've paid. And I start to think about, hmm, maybe I should change that. Maybe I should change that. Maybe I should consider changing that. I had totally forgotten to include my credit card debt in my uh, best guesstimates to begin. Uh, I don't think of that as one total expenditure, like, uh, and it could have been for clothing, it could have been for car repair, it could be for a variety of things, but because I paid, you know, a cash lump sum on the credit card payment, I haven't really included that as an expense on my list. Um, so, as you can see here from doing this organization that I ended up actually spending $649 more than I thought I did. Now, whether that's a good thing or not, I don't know. This isn't identifying that right now because I don't know what your best guesstimate is, is that if that's the amount of money that you have available to spend each month or not. But we'll talk about that more a little later in the presentation. Um, when we look at this list, there's a couple of things when you're getting acquainted with your spending habits that um, you want to take into consideration is if you can see from this list that the um, things that I spent the most money on are at the top of the list. But at the bottom of the list are those invisible expenses that I keep talking about that I don't really think about. And so it's telling me how I am prioritizing my spending habits. So, Guess what? Congratulations. Uh, you basically just created a budget, but it's a very informal budget and the budget is not something that you're going to write in stone and you're going to have to adhere to. Basically, a budget is a way of thinking about your finances. And going through this process, studies show that people who take the time to do this and analyze their spending 
subconsciously rethink their priorities and start to make small but significant changes in their spending habits. It's easy to pro procrastinate looking at your finances, but doing it periodically can really help you feel more in control of your finances. So the most powerful tool for managing personal finances is to make those small but significant changes and by knowing where your money is going. Okay, now that we've gotten kind of acquainted with how our, we're spending money and we've looked at the fact that we have spent exceeded spending in one category or another that we didn't think about initially and we want like to make some changes and maybe to save a little bit of money, here's some tips for how that I'd like to share with you for how to do that. Easy, practical tips. The first one that I referred to in the previous slide that caught me by surprise was um, my cable TV package and my stream, streaming services. Uh, all of those extra channels that I subscribe to so that I can watch um, various movies and TV shows that I don't get on just my regular um, cable TV package. And when I looked at those and I could see that I had, you know, subscribed to Hulu, to HBO Max, to Paramount Plus, to Apple TV, and it just kind of accumulated over time. Every time I would find something I wanted to watch, but it required me to have a different streaming service, I would sign up for it. And those things came right out of my uh, bank account or, or on my credit card. And so it's something I wasn't paying much attention to. So I went back and I looked at my TV packages and my streaming services to make sure they weren't overlapping. And the ones that I weren't using very much, the streaming services I wasn't using very much, I went in and canceled immediately. And that could save you, you know, 10, 12, $15 a month. It, those add up, especially if I'm not using them. Um, this one uh, is uh, kind of personal to me um, because I told you about my reading vice of buying uh, eBooks all the time. So when I, I've made a promise to myself that when I go in there and before I add, click on add to cart and purchase it, I make a vow to go to the library the next day and see if I could borrow it from there. They can either, uh, either they have the book available there or they can arrange an interlibrary loan. But the other thing that I'm not sure if you're aware of is that uh, the Butte County Libraries have an online um, application where you can actually check out digital books from the library as well. Um, it's called Libby. And so uh, if you're interested in that, um, just go into the library and ask to get set up so that you can um, check out digital uh, books um, right from the right from the library. Uh, I'm, a lot of us, if you're like me, we get a lot of marketing emails every day. It's like my inbox is inundated and I've gotten on those lists because I've been somewhere and I wanted to take wanted to access some content on a website, but it's made me enter my name and email address before I can access that site, that content. So um, they've got my email address and then I get flooded with all kinds of marketing emails. So um, try to take time to unsubscribe. Usually it's quite easy, right? It says right at the bottom, click here to unsubscribe. Uh, what uh, marketers count on is the fact that you won't take the time to unsubscribe and so that you're just going to get the same email over and over and over again and marketing uh, focuses on getting their message in front of consumers time and time again and to the point where uh, they can generate a sale so by just getting rid of the marketing emails you kind of take that temptation away of buying something that maybe you don't really really need um, Here's, here's one that I'm sure you're all aware of. You need to ask about discounts because there's discounts for all kinds of different categories. I'm surprised at how many. Here's a few of the basic ones, of course, for senior citizens or students, teachers, military, if you belong to AAA, if you, if you are a member of AARP. Um, the list goes on. And the only way to really know what kind of discounts 
uh, you could get on a product or a service is to actually ask the salesperson what kind of discounts do you have available um, it never hurts to ask and you may be pleasantly surprised that you would be able to uh, qualify for one of those discounts and save yourself some money here's one i don't think a lot of people know about buying a car at the end of the month um, i'm sure you all know that car salesmen work on a commission basis they are paid for each car that they sell and the dealerships uh, set up a sales uh, plan for each salesman each month basically and that sales plan includes how many cars that they're supposed to sell and if they sell that many cars they outline the perks that they're going to be able to get by reach if they reach their target goal um, and what happens typically throughout the month is that uh, it could be a slow month as far as selling cars so as the end of the month draws near and the salesman is looking at his sales target and he hasn't reached that yet he becomes more motivated to sell you a car so he's uh, more willing to negotiate a lower price because by selling that car and taking a lower price he will be able to take advantage of the perks that he'll be awarded at the end of the month for having reached his uh, sales quota so uh, try that out it, it works really well uh, buying a car at the end of the month okay here here's a couple more that i'm going to go over real quickly uh, many retail stores now lots of retail stores have you know apps that you can put on your phone that have coupons on them and what you can do using those uh, apps is you can go in and you can clip that coupon digitally so that when you go to use that uh, when you go to the retail location to buy whatever product you're going to buy that coupon is automatically applied to your purchase um, i'm talking about things like uh, safeway uh, michael's uh, barnes and noble uh, I can't and those are just some of, off the top of my head that I can think about but these are really really helpful I've always hated clipping coupons like out of the paper or out of magazines and I never did it um, until recently the, the, now we have these automatic coupons and it saves a lot I go to the grocery store and it says Safeway and it says at the end of my receipt oh you saved $48 today um, so uh, it's really a significant savings um, there are other apps that you can use that you probably have seen advertised or heard about called Rakuten and I bought a can and basically these are cash back apps so if you go onto their app and you go into a store like Kohl's where you want to purchase something and you purchase it through Rakuten it will give you on a certain amount percentage of cash back so maybe five percent cash back so basically you're getting a additional discount from Kohl's of five percent by buying that item um, through Rakuten or Ibotta can so those are some um, apps that are worth looking into to, to save uh, a little bit of money to get a little bit of extra savings on items that you're gonna buy here's a really important one that I want you to think about and you know we talked about those miscellaneous expenses from your ATM and you didn't know where that money went it just kind of flew through your fingers banks issue prepaid credit cards it's just like a credit card except you go in and you say I want a prepaid credit card for $300 and actually you can buy them at um, Safeway or at CVS but you can also buy them through the bank so if I decide that okay I really want to keep track of you know I'm going to spend $200 for incidentals in cash during the month I, that's what I'm going to keep it to and I want to be able to track what I'm spending it on then you use the um, prepaid card and it's going to list all your transactions and you're going to be able to more carefully get acquainted with 
where that cash is going. And here's the other very cool thing. So let's say I want to do it for 200 bucks for the month. And by the end of the month, I find out that I haven't spent all $200, that I actually have $20 left over. The next month, I'm going to want to top it up or bring the balance back up to $200. Since I have $20 on there already, all I have to do is add another $180 in. So it's like a kind of a secret savings of $20 if you want to think about it that way. Um, and over time, again, that adds up. Maybe um, I didn't use $20 this month, so I saved it. Then I didn't use $40 next month. So it's kind of a snowball effect. Um, very basic one that I'm sure you're aware of is buying private or generic uh, products, private label or generic products. Um, generally, uh, private label products are made specifically for a grocery store like Safeway, but most often they're made the exact same way or the exact same product as the name brand. So, and it can be significantly cheaper, uh, a buck, a two bucks. If you go and you uh, to CVS and you look at the CVS brand versus the name brand, and you can see the difference is quite often significantly different. And then I know that this advertisement's been on TV a lot. It's called Checkout Shopping with Capital One. And Capital One has a, uh, it's called a browser extension, so that when you're uh, looking to buy something online, the browser is, uh, Capital One is going to go use that information and look throughout the internet to see what kind of coupons or deals that you might be able to get on that product and uh, and basically uh, notify you th that before you buy that product. Um, there's some there's some catches with these apps that I'm talking about like Capital One and Rakuten and Ibotta can. So I really suggest that you go on and you read all you can about them because it's you know how they're how they're handling the money that they're saving you or tracking your information, that might be something you want to consider. Um, the last one I'm going to talk about right here is what I call a sleep on it rule. So uh, there are times when I'm considering making a more significant um, out of the ordinary kind of a purchase. I think, oh my gosh, I, I really would like to have a bigger dishwasher that is more energy efficient. And so I go and look at dishwashers and I find out, you know, that they're $500 or $750 now, which is significant. So I have a sleep on it rule, which means that I just look that day and I go home and I think it over and I sleep on it. And then the next morning I get up and I think a little bit more and maybe I decide after I've slept on it that maybe that's not something I can really afford this month. Maybe I should put that off to next month or that's going to be too big of an expenditure this month. Maybe I really need to think about a way to put a couple hundred bucks away for the next two months so that that really doesn't uh, blow my personal finances out of the water. So that's what I call a, a sleep on it rule. Um, and you can set a, you know, mentally set a limit, right, of what you think of a, as a significant expense. Um, for me, that might be $500. For you, it may be a thousand dollars, but that's that's what I call the sleep on it rule. Um, one of the biggest things when we're talking about personal finance, of course, is how to use credit cards wisely. Um, credit cards are easy, uh, and unless you're paying very close attention and really uh, analyzing your spending habits with credit cards, it can be so easy for it to spiral out of control. And so here's some tips about how to use a credit card wisely. First of all, all credit cards are not created equal. And there is a website on the internet called lendingtree.com. And it lists all the credit cards with all the features that each of those credit cards have with all the pros and all the cons of those like, do they have a cash back option? Do they have a mileage option? Uh, what kind of a credit limit do they have? Uh, 
there are just there are tons of different features that these credit cards have incorporated in them to them in order to compete with each other to get your business. Um, so I really recommend going to LendingTree.com before obtaining a credit card or maybe even to look at to see if you should uh, trade your old credit card in for a better deal um, and looking at the different credit cards on LendingTree.com. One of the biggest things that you'll see there when you look at LendingTree.com, you're going to see the interest rates on the credit cards, which is high at the moment. It's like 15, 18, 20 percent, which is really an, a lot of credit uh, interest on that credit card. But make sure and uh, find out if the interest rate is fixed or variable. So fixed means that when I take the credit card out today, if I am getting a 12 percent interest rate, it's going to stay that way as long as I have the credit card. Whereas if it's saying, OK, here's a variable rate and I'm going to offer you 8 percent to begin with, but that rate can vary depending on economic uh, situation. So it could go from 8% up to 12%, maybe up to 15%. And um, most often it goes up, but it doesn't generally come down. And so uh, if you get locked into a credit card with a variable rate quite quickly, rather than getting that initial great rate you thought you were going to get, you are going to be locked into something uh, at a much higher rate. And Part of using your credit cards wisely is making sure to monitor your credit score. And uh, there are apps for that. There's an app for everything as well. But I also there, um, monitor my credit score through my bank. I use Tri-Counties Bank locally. And every month they have a, a place that I can uh, click on in order to see my credit score. And my credit score you know, affects everything from how much from whether I can rent, you know, what kind of uh, deal I can get on a credit card, uh, if I can take out a loan, how much of a loan I can take out. So really monitoring your credit score and taking action around how you could uh, repair your credit if you have fallen um, to, the, to a low credit score. Uh, this is really going to help you ultimately save money in the long run and is quite often really worth uh, taking the time to do. So here's some, if you want to pay off, if you have multiple credit cards and you want to pay them off, here is a tip for how to do that. It's called the debt snowball. So what you want to do is pay off your credit card with the lowest balance first. So you're going to make minimum payments on all the uh, credit cards except the smallest one. And you're going to take and pay as much money as you can on that smallest uh, balance. So what happens is once the small balance is gone, now I'm going to take that payment and apply it to the next smallest payment on credit card and continue to make a minimum payment on all the rest. So eventually what I've done is I basically kind of consolidated my credit cards into one by doing this snowball effect. So one, once I've gotten done paying credit card A and I was paying $100 a month on it, I'm going to go to credit card B. The minimum payment on it was $50. I'm going to add the $100 I'm saving on the paid off credit card. So now I'm paying $150 on my second lowest balance. And when I pay that off, now I have $150 that I can take, apply it to credit card C to my minimum amount that I've been paying and pay that off. And it's really a snowball effect on how quickly you can pay off your credit card debt so that you're back to having one or two credit cards that are entirely manageable. As far as if you only have a single credit card, there are some tips too for how, how to pay off your single credit card. First of all, setting up an automatic payment from your bank is really important. Instead of waiting to see how much money you have at the end of the month that you could maybe apply to your credit card, you know, making a by making an automatic payment from your bank, you've like committed to a payment that you're going to make. And in your mind when you've done that and you're going through the month and you're um, spending your money, you you always have in the back of your mind that, oh, 
uh, $150 has got to come out of this balance at some point for my credit card. So it's going to adjust the ways that you're thinking about and tracking, mentally tracking how you're spending your money. Um, if you have a home, if you have, own your own home, uh, and because credit card rates are so outrageous right now, uh, to me they are 15, 18, 20, 22 percent. If you own a home, consider taking out a home equity loan. Go to see your banker, see what kind of equity that you have in your loan, how much your house value exceeds what your mortgage is, and see if your bank will give you a home equity loan. And those loans are going to be so much lower uh, interest rates. So you can take that home equity loan, pay off the balance on the credit card where you're paying 18, 20 percent interest, and now you have one home equity loan that you may be paying five or six interest on. So you're going to pay it off in a much quicker period of time. And finally, the most important thing that um, I try to emphasize to people is you have to pay more than the minimum payment due. Uh, credit cards love it when you just pay the minimum payment due because ultimately it's a win-win situation for them. Basically the minimum credit card payments are 2% of your average monthly balance on that credit card. So I want to show you kind of what's called a calculation, uh, amortization calculation. So let's say that you have a balance account of 5000 So my minimum monthly payment is $100. And that's what I'm paying on that 5000 So when I do this calculation, I come up with the fact that if I have 5000 it's going to take me 94 months to pay off this $5,000. And over those 94 months, I'm going to pay $4,300 in interest which means I'm going to pay almost the exact same amount of interest as to what I have spent on my purchases on my credit card. And to me, that's just absolutely astounding. I want to show you something, though. Look here. If I, same credit card balance, but I decide to pay a, something in addition to my minimum monthly payment, something as small as 50 bucks, so now rather than 100 I'm paying $150. Look at what it does to how quickly I pay it off and what my interest is. Rather than 94 months, it's taking me 47 months to pay it off. And the interest I'm paying is $1,900 or basically $2,000. So I have saved myself a lot of money by just increasing my monthly payment by $50 a month. So, uh, these, this is a Capital One, uh, as you can see up at the top, that I, it's at CapitalOne.com is where the, uh, you can find this kind of a calculator and really see for yourself the benefits of rather than making a minimum monthly payment, of just finding out um, how much money, how much money and in interest you can save by just increasing your monthly payment even just a little bit. Let's talk quickly about taxes. Um, because of the time of the year, uh, tax fi filing time, and basically I'm going to ask you if you think you get good news or bad news. Um, for a lot of people, the bad news is that you are not having enough withheld from your paycheck. So at the end of the year, you come up with a really big tax bill that uh, includes penalties and interests, and it's really a bucket of cold water in your face, but now all of a sudden you owe a lot of money and you have no resources uh, to come up with to pay that bill. Um, and that's and that's bad news and that's very stressful. Um, so paying attention to if you're having to owe taxes every month, if you get that big tax bill on April 15th every month, then that's the time to go in and look at how much um, you're having withheld in federal and state taxes from your paycheck so that you can uh, minimize the surprise you get on April 15. Uh, one note about that is that if you decide that you're going to extend uh, filing your taxes beyond April 15th and you owe taxes, the extension is only an extension of a time to file your tax return. 
it is not an ex time for an extension to pay what you owe. So the penalties and interests on what you owe on as of April 15th will continue to grow until you actually pay that tax bill. It's uh, you're not it doesn't defer basically uh, your payment. You have to pay that right on April 15th. So the good news might be something like this, that you're getting a big refund. So what I want to say about that is it's not always great news. And here's why. The government is not paying you interest on the money you get back when you file. So if I get back $2,000 on April 15th after I filed my taxes, and the government has held that money all that time, if I had just adjusted how much I was having withheld from my uh, paycheck for federal and state taxes so it more evenly matched what I expected to pay in taxes at the end of the year, I could be taking that money every month and pay it down, using it to pay down my credit card. Um, the other thing I have found about people who love getting a big refund back after they file their taxes is that sometimes that's a savings account that they, you know, feel like they can use that money to splurge on something. But in the meantime, like I said, that money, you've been incurring credit card costs as you've gone along, and the money that if you were to adjust your paycheck and be having more uh, money in your take-home pay so that you don't have as big of a refund, you could actually be using that to pay off your credit card instead of kind of continuing to ignore your credit card, hoping it would take care of itself. So uh, two considerations there. Bad news is if you're not paying enough, and good news, but not so great news if you're getting a big return. Think about how you should handle that differently. So we've talked about some more esoteric ways of saving your money, making minor changes in how you save your money. Uh, here's a couple of more ways to save to your savings account. Uh, I think a lot of people do this, which is saving their loose change, but the thing that I, I do that I think is a little different than other people is I save my loose change in an opaque container. I'm a container that I cannot see through. Um, a, a glass jar I can see through and I can see how quickly my uh, loose change is accumulating and I got a lot of money in savings and I'm all excited and I'm going to go in and uh, cash that in so I can, you know, buy a, you know, new uh, high tech gadget that I want to buy. If you have it in an opaque container, mentally, it basically, you accumulate it, and then when you finally do have a chance to look at it, generally you have found that you've accumulated uh, more or less than you expected. And in my case, it's usually more than I've expected. Whereas with a glass container, um, it's kind of like I'm keeping a running tally, and it's, it's not really a bonus to me when I take it down and uh, change it into dollars at like the Coinstar machine at Safeway. Um, another saving app that you could use, besides the ones I talked about like Rakuten and Ibotacan, is that these apps are actually uh, connected to a couple of different kinds of banks where you can set up accounts and uh, use this app to when you buy something for uh, uh, something less than even dollars, you can round your purchases up to the next nearest dollar. And that amount that you round it up to um, automatically goes into your the checking account that's associated with this app in, um, at a certain bank. So for example, if I buy something for $1.60, it rounds it up to uh, $2 and it puts 40 cents automatically into my checking account. So again, it's kind of a virtual way of saving your loose change in an opaque container. Um, there's one called Capital, and it's uh, basically a game, kind of a thing where you define a savings goal, and then you choose a activity that will trigger an automatic savings that will go into your 
uh, savings account and help you to reach that savings goal. So for example, uh, I just find that I want to save a hundred bucks and I say in the app, every time I don't buy a latte, I will put a dollar into my savings account. Or every time I go to the gym, I'll put $2 into my savings account. So uh, Monday morning, I don't buy a latte. I go into my app and I say, I didn't buy a latte and boom, a dollar has gone into my savings account. So it's kind of a virtual game of uh, kind of an incentive as a way of um, saving money. And the final one <laughs> that seems silly is, but can be surprisingly effective is put cash in a pillowcase under your bed. The reason I say this is one, here's one of my favorite stories. So my mother-in-law who grew up during the recession and worked all her adult life um, as a uh, clerk at uh, Sears um, for not a whole bunch of money, had a very strong savings ethic. And with every little bit of money she saved, she bought a savings bond. During the war years, the uh, government issued savings bonds, which were basically you bought a certificate that would pay you $10, but if you bought it ahead of time for $8, then you would get $10 when you cashed it in. So it's basically earning interest on the original $8 that you paid for the bond. So my wonderful mother-in-law, bless her heart, put her money into savings bonds for years and years. And so when they passed and we were going through the house, we discovered under her bed a pillowcase and it was full of savings bonds worth $44,000. So, and so me to me that said okay here's a here's something great right put a five bucks in your pillowcase put ten bucks in my pillowcase don't look at it just let it accumulate um maybe it's better off in a bank but there's something about taking that cash right and putting it in something and saving it versus it being you know having to go to the bank and putting it in the bank and having to look at pieces of paper for what you have there. So uh, using a uh, pillowcase might sound silly, but you might something you might want to consider. So here's the bottom line and the things that I hope that you'll take away from today's seminar. Uh, first thing is, is know where your money's going. Take time to do that worksheet that we talked about just to get acquainted with where you're going. You're not really going to do it to draw up a budget. You're actually getting acquainted with your finances and kind of making a mental budget by doing that. You can't do it unless you sit down and you understand what one month's worth of expenses look for. Um, small changes are incremental. Basically, in your, uh, in your savings habits, if you want to save money, choose something like three really small savings tips to implement this year. They don't have to be major. They could be simple and easy and just commit to three of them. And uh, over the over the next year, now you'll have seen, have a feel like you're better in control of your finances and increased your savings as well. Um, try to commit. The hardest one is to pay down your debt using the money you save by making those small changes. So rather than somehow rewarding yourself and splurging on something else, um, the heart, you know, just for those three money saving tips, take that money and use it to pay down debt. So uh, I hope this uh, seminar has been helpful to you, that maybe I've given you some food for thought, things to think about, uh, encouraging you to uh, kind of take some time to look at your finances and uh, start to feel like you're more in control of them uh, in the coming year. And uh, while my kids were grow young and growing up, we had, we had a common maxim when we were talking about money. And this is what we always said. You know what? Savings are incremental. 50 cents is 50 cents. And what we meant by that when we told our kids that was, you know, there was always, well, well, it's only a dollar. 
or it's only five dollars or uh you know can i have 50 cents for the uh, video games can i have another 50 cents for the video games and so we really wanted to give our kids the knowledge that all money is valuable and not and uh it, it is a cumulative that you don't it, it's not isolated incidences 50 50 cents here and a dollar there it's not isolated it is a cumulative so remembering that 50 cents is 50 cents on an ongoing basis with how you're saving money i think is a a good motto to um, adopt so thank you very much one of the things i'd like to add here at the bottom is that i will uh, be sending a library a copy paper copy and a, a digital copy of the slides of this presentation and so that you can go back and review it at your leisure and it, you can also uh, you know refer back to it to see what kind of websites i have mentioned um, throughout the presentation so thank you very much and good luck and i hope you have a great 2022